Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, brought to you by Sound Talent Media and Evergreen Podcasts, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians, talk all about their lives and music while sharing a craft beer. I hope that you've been doing amazing. I hope you had a killer month of April. I most certainly did. I am back. Vox and Hops is back, and I'm very stoked about that. This Vox and Hops episode is presented by Heavy Montreal. Heavy Montreal are Montreal's premier metal promoter, and I'm very stoked to have them supporting the podcast. I'm beyond stoked to be showcasing Murder Method for today's artist spotlight. Murder Method is a brutal death metal band from York, Pennsylvania that formed in 2018. Get ready, everyone. Here is their track, No Regard for Human Life.
damn, that was brutal. That was Murder Methods, No Regard for Human Life. It is their title track off their latest album, which dropped back in September 2022. You should definitely go check them out. I put their link to their band camp in the description of this podcast. Massive cheers to Murder Method for being today's artist spotlight. Now, before we jump into today's episode, I'd just like to ask you to follow the Vox and Hops Metal podcast on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, I would love for you to tell a friend about the podcast. If there's someone in your life that just loves craft beer, well, you should let them know that the Vox and Hops Metal podcast exists. You can tell them that there are over 400 episodes where I sit down with metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while sharing killer craft beers. If you were to encourage one of your craft beer enthusiast friends to become a brand new Vox and Hops head, that would be something that I would truly appreciate. Now, today's episode is a special one because on April 15th in Montreal, it was Heavy Montreal Presents Vox and Hops' Brutal Montreal 2023, a massive show, a massive night of fun. Get ready, everyone. This is Vox and Hops episode number 404, and it's all about Brutal Montreal. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Here we are backstage. I'm M. Tellis, Brutal Montreal 2023. I'm with Nate Bergman. He literally just stepped off stage. I love doing this. I love ambushing artists as they step off stage to have a chat with them to see how their experience was. Now, tonight is a special night for many reasons because, Nate, you grew up here in Montreal. You've played Metropolis before. You, you, Montreal's an important part of your life. Uh, coming back on this big show, and then it was sort of a shitty day, which we'll get to. But tell me about your anticipation coming back to Montreal and playing M. Tellus again. Um, my grandparents and father um, are from here. I mean, my, my dad grew up here. Um, and Montreal, for me, um, is a very special place. Um, I mean, even if I wasn't connected to the city in any way, uh, having played shows here and spent time here, the 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 culture, the the how old and beautiful the city is, um, it's it's rich history and music and arts and food. It's one of the greatest. It's as close to Europe as it gets on in North America, and it, it's a, it is. Uh, it's definitely in my top three favorite cities in North America without any... It might be number one for me, so... That makes me very happy to yeah. hear that. We are here drinking a... Uh, ooh, I am so <laughs> No, I love it. Keep, I'm, I'm so going to keep it. Okay. I'm going to keep it. I apologize. <laughs> a Mikro Brasserie for Origins. We're drinking the McKeeran Cassis Royale. Um, so so it's with black currants. It's a slightly tart, 5%. Delicious. I'm loving it. Four Origins is a very cool brewery from here in Montreal. It's an important part of the, the craft brew industry. Awesome. Take me back to your your very first beer on stage you mentioned that you were drinking maybe underage down the streets of St. Catherine in your youth take me to your uh, Molson <laughs> it was my first beer ever and, and what's that story well my, my older cousins took me to a bar when I was four, 14 or 15 and we got yeah. drunk <laughs> yeah you know uh for me I I cut my teeth in this city in a lot of ways I'm maybe my parents are going to listen to this and I don't want to go too far into it but there's a nightlife in this city that's unlike any other city, <laughs> it, it, you know. It, it, Vancouver comes close, but Montreal, is, that's it. I mean, it's it's a nightlife town. It's true, and I'm stoked to be here with you right now. Take me to today. Today was a bit of a shitty day. You had to perform basically completely by yourself for the first part of the set, and then John Paul from Clutch jumped in to help you out, which is fucking sick. But to take take me through today, it was a rough day for the Clutch camp and yourself. Well, for me, really, I was riding along with Clutch, so it wasn't a very rough day for me. I just had to sit in a tour bus and eat potato chips. <laughs> so for me, it was really fine. Um, but there's a, there's a process with my band that's underway that's going to make them official to be able to travel with me everywhere, but I can't go too far into details about it, but that process becomes official in September. So um, bringing them here f for this round of shows was not possible. Um, and when we found that out, uh, John Paul Gaster, who is um, the drummer of Clutch and also a great friend, but also one of my, probably my, fa it, it, he is my favorite living drummer, um, aside from my own drummer. Um, he offered to sit in and make some noise with me so for me it was a no brainer yeah of course your friend wants to play during your set yeah 
It's pretty fucking cool. It was very fucking cool. <laughs> and it allows me to also play the electric guitar. Yeah. And give people kind of an idea more of what the I do. The album. Yeah. I honestly, I discovered you because you're a part of Brutal. And cool. I listened to the album and I was captivated. Oh, thanks so and much. It's so That's good. Really the production's nice amazing. You. Thank you. The, the harmonies, the, the female voices. But tonight, so raw, stripped back. Yeah. Still goosebumps. Just oh, man. Thank you. Take me to the soundtrack of your youth, getting into music. Ooh. What music did your parents or guardians listen to? Okay, so I inherited music from my parents. Essentially, like, my father was into a lot of classic rock, CCR, Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen, of course, you know, a fellow Montreal Jew. Like, that's a big deal in our family. Um, so a lot of that. Um, you know, Zeppelin and um, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, that spectrum. And then my mom was really into folk and Motown. So I got a lot of like The Temptations and Sam Cooke and Otis Redding and uh, the Ronettes and Joan Baez and Joni Mitchell and Joan Armentrade. And, and so I had this really well rounded thing happening from when I was probably seven or eight. And then, of course, nine or ten, I discovered uh, Nirvana. Uh, which led me to this, you know, growing up in D.C., it, it kind of leads you directly to Fugazi and the Bad Brains and Minor Threat, um, that era. So really, and then being from D.C. too, being immersed in like there's a, a genre of music from D.C. called go-go music um, and hip-hop. And so I, I was really lucky when I was coming into music in the 90s there were bands like Clutch that had really started to make a name for themselves and then Biggie Smalls and and also, you know, extreme music not extreme, but you know, Bad Brains and stuff was already legendary at that point. So I had a, a foundation I like to say I had a foundation in the classics and then had a really good dis age of discovery in the nineties where it was like you know, I was raised on M T V and much music, to be fair, in the summers when I would be in Montreal. So I watched hours of uh, Headbangers Ball, uh, Total Request Live, 120 Minutes, um, and it, it, it completely formed my musical vernacular. We're lucky to to be having it be so catered for us. There was so much variety back then. It was gate it was gatekeeping, but the quality I think Absolutely. was a bit higher. Where now there's not really as much gatekeeping, which is cool because more people can get in, but you have to sift through a lot more shit. Yes, so everything that we purchased or, or digested or exposed to seems to, and maybe it's just I'm old now, be more memorable and valuable. As opposed to now with streaming, I, it, it makes streaming makes music more disposable. For I sure. consume so much more of it, but I love a lot less of it. What streaming has really shown me too is that how many bands are bad live. Yeah, yeah. right. Like <laughs> streaming, any it's so easy now to make a song in Logic, yeah. and then upload it on on DistroKid, and then your song's on Spotify. So yeah. now all of a sudden you're a guy who makes music. This is your identity. But yeah. you've done. Very little work to to hone in the craft uh, yeah, of performing. Spending, I mean, I mean, my solo career started in 2020, 2021. But before wow. that, I was in a band that toured all over the world for for about, I mean, all, almost 20 years. Holy shit! Okay. So, so for me, this is new. But like, I spent my whole life working towards it. So, th there's less of that happening now. Take me to your first show. Do you remember the first show you went to go see? Uh, absolutely. 1990, 1992, Voodoo Lounge Tour, Rolling Stones, RFK Stadium. Wow. I think I was nine. And that made me want to do music. And the funny part is the Counting Crows opened, and they were very good. And then the Rolling Stones came on. It was like, oh, this is this is what it this is what it is. Your first time on stage. Do you remember that day? Really being on stage, I actually think I played guitar at my friend's bar mitzvah sang and played a song and then in middle school um put a small band together and kind of played it like the theater some theater production we did a pseudo talent show type of thing and then yeah started playing house parties kind of in high school and then it just rolled yeah as soon as i graduated high school i got i got in a van with my buddies and we just started touring so and then 20 years later 20 yeah. years later here i am in montreal uh I got to find a LaBelle province to walk to after to we the talk. Right. You step outside, you turn to the right. It's right here. It's right there. It's my favorite. It's, it's the I one on St. Laurent. I dream about it. <laughs> it's funny because it was under renovation and closed for a few weeks, but it's open now. For me. <laughs>
<laughs> Merci. You know, right just for me. Discovering your voice, honing in on your voice. We're sitting. I, I'm backstage, and you're backstage. I can see all of your vocal stuff. I'm a singer. I've been there. Listen, I've, look. This is my bag. I call this my bag of mental illness. This, I I, but this is where I'm headed with exactly this vocal question. Vocal straws, yeah. vocal zones, potions, projects, v- two type cool vaporizer, warm vaporizer. I got it all, baby. Jesus Christ! And is that? I'll send you a list. It's a fucking page no, no, I'm, I'm at the point where I'm like, I don't think about my voice until I warm up before the show, because if not, I was doing that and I was obsessing. I'm obsessed. Where does that come from? Was it always like that? Is it something that's more recent? Because I think my natural inclination is to sing improperly, as most people's is. My natural inclination as a as a person who talks loud yeah. is to is to is to push a lot of air through my vocal cords and and it, it does yeah. a lot of damage yeah and so i'm learning to treat them and soothe them and i take a lot i take lessons i mean i work at it constantly so it's always a work in progress a voice a human voice it's such a delicate interesting instrument because you can't see what's going on and and the thing about it is it's it's it, it's one of the few instruments that you can make the instrument better. Yeah. Like that drum kit comes assembled. Yeah. That drum kit is... You is, can get new skins, maybe. You can get new skins. You can get new... Symbols or whatever. Symbols, yeah. but you, you, can't, uh, you, you can't make it better. It is what it is. But your voice, you can hone, hone it. So... At what point are you satisfied? Because I, I consider you an extremely proficient vocalist. I, I, I think before I pressed record, I said... Miles Kennedy gets a lot of yeah. heat and hype, but I don't see I you being that. that far off, honestly. Yeah, I mean, my, I, th- I do think Miles Kennedy is very talented, but I, I, I can, I would, th- I think about myself more as a songwriter. You know what I mean? I'm, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not just a singer in some guy's band, and I don't think Miles Kennedy is either. But he's a guy that will go sing for. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, slash a, a, a higher gun Yeah, vocalist. yeah, that's yeah. not my boat. My boat is to be a... I'm an artist, and 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 I, that's... I don't just want to sing. I want to emote, you know? How hard was it for you to take the leap to go solo after being in a band for 20 years? Pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the money's way better. You didn't mean divide by... <laughs> um, you know, for me, it was really natural... I've always, as soon as I started doing this, I've always looked at it as something I would do for the rest of my life. And I was playing music with a group of guys who are incredibly talented and, and maybe saw their, their path change a little bit. And for me, there was never any question that this is what I do. So I just kind of kept writing because I was writing anyway. Is it basically an extension of what you were doing before? No. Give everyone a shout out for people that aren't aware. I was in a band called Lion Eyes and the band was... Um, Heavy riff rock blended with like psychedelic reggae, dub reggae stuff, and it was really cool. And everything I learned about music and touring and life came from those experiences. But it wasn't a singular voice of expression, and I think for me, it's really, it's been cool coming from something that's purely collaborate co- collaborative to something that's a, my singular voice. So if it sucks, it's my fault, and if it's good, it's my fault. And I like existing there right now. It's pretty fucking cool. This beer is incredible, by the way. Okay, I'm glad you like it. I'll let, I'll let Keegan and Mike know that you like it very much. <laughs> the process of writing solo versus with a group of people is definitely your identity that's coming out. Was it much easier? Was it something you were already working on on the side when you were in Lion Eyes? No, it, I never thought about it. I never thought I would write songs by myself. But I found myself in 2019 before the pandemic in a position where... It was, are you going to stop playing music or are you going to push push forward? And I, my hand was kind of forced and I, I, I chose to keep going. So art, The art was too strong. It, it, the, 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 I'll be honest with you. I, I was pretty depressed for a while when the band kind of stopped working. And I did a, 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 a hefty, hefty dose of DMT. And the DMT really opened my eyes to what was possible cre- Creatively it, within my own wow. self. Good for you. Yeah, I mean, taking taking a leap. I, well, I took a le- I took drugs. I, I just needed a perspective change, and it, and and it was the drug that gave me the change. And and that drug could be exercise or coffee or exactly. nicotine or w- whatever. I don't you know marijuana, whatever. 
Mine was DMT. I love to talk about mental health, and this is a perfect jump sure. off point. Uh, what do you do, aside from taking DMT, to pull yourself out of the dark when you're not feeling well? Exer- try to exercise consistently. Try to eat, eat healthy. And try to sing and play music every day. Singing is so cathartic. And, um, it's true. It's Get that, fucking like, rad. Get yeah. moment there. Yeah. And sometimes there when you just hit yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know when I'm doing it right and it yeah. feels good. And, and You're vibrating. Same thing with working on songs. You know, sometimes it's really frustrating and then you get that aha moment and your day is better. Yeah. You feel like you did something. So, yeah. And then there's other days when oh. <laughs> you hit the Deep, wall. dark depression. <laughs> And then trying to get out of a depression by writing correct leads you back into a correct. depression. <laughs> correct. I'm doing a new segment called Fight the Hops, where I ask my guests a small-term goal they're working on, something they hope to achieve within the next two months, let's say. What are you doing right now to fight the hops? To trying to have a, a successful tour. Yes. That's my goal. Yes. It's right in front of me. And... Um, and to drink more of this beer. And then I think we've mission mission accomplished. That I can do. <laughs> Listen, it doesn't matter how you get there. You just got to get there. So, What is a successful tour for you? What does that mean? Because success can mean a lot of things. I mean, let's be very frank. A successful tour is playing well consistently, creating energy and a community on stage between you and the fans, whoever's there, to make new fans, and to make money. Like, if I can get through the tour and I've made the tour work financially, that's a success. And I, you know, you can, li- you can, you can be idealistic about it, but, like, for me, those three components lead to a successful tour. I agree, because every day passes, we get a little bit older. It's nice to, to have a successful financially tour. You can't pay the rent with vibes, exactly. dude. Exactly. If you could, I'd be living in a mansion. <laughs> So, <laughs> one last question. Yeah. Classic Vox and Hops wrap up question. Problem doesn't happen to you very often. Hypothetically, it will happen to you tomorrow morning if you keep going on all these Four Origins beers. And I will. What is your hangover cure? Ooh. Left, specifically if, if we're in Montreal, it's, it is a packet of LMNT or any electrolyte brand. So, salt. A Montreal bagel from uh, St. Vieter. I'm no fool. Okay, brother. <laughs> Lox, cream cheese, onions, capers, and cold leftover poutine from the Belle Province. <laughs> and if you want to get real, if you want to make sure that you're going to take a nap, smoked meat from Schwartz's, but Holy also shit. cold leftover from the fr- in the fridge. Moist. Full fat. <laughs> done. Done, done, and done. Nate, thank you so, so much. Taking the time, stepping off stage, sitting down with me. Thank you. I really enjoyed your set. Yeah, thank I'm you a very new much. Fan. I'm a new fan. I like it very much. Cheers Thanks to you. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Hey, what's up, everyone? Here we are backstage at Brutal Montreal 2023. I'm hanging out with Danny from Amigo the Devil. Danny, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. I'm still shaking. My brains are mashed potatoes. I'll be up in about 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. It's, it's, it's early afternoon. Um, as things happen in the world of metal rock tours, um, buses break down and Clutch is not here yet, but they're going to be here. They're going to make it happen. We're going to pull together and make everything just, just happen. It's just the way that we do things. How do you guys handle when shit goes wrong? What is the first sentiment when you find out bad news on the road? Uh, the the funny thing about this tour specifically is, it, it's the first time we've ever been on a bus. Oh, congrats! This is the first this is the first bus tour we've ever done. So usually when things go wrong, in the van on the van side of things, since I do all the driving, is I panic, <laughs> I have a meltdown. Everyone else rallies to not allow me to explode. <laughs> this was the first time that we already had something happen. Somebody rear-ended. Our trailer, Jeez. the trailer unhitched and went into the bus. <laughs> this, and this tour started four days ago, everyone. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, all the forces that be took care of it immediately without any stress at all. So I think I've slowly been learning to, to let go a little bit of the whole control side. And uh, truly understand that problems are going to happen. Shit's going to happen no matter what. 
It's always best if it's out of your control to just sort of let loose. So, so typically you drive. Yes. Every tour. Every tour. So, so now this is this is cool. So, so I've I've been on a tour bus. It's a nice experience. Um, what are you doing with all the extra time you have? Um, I brought a lot of writing materials. I brought a lot of reading materials. And I have done none of it. <laughs> that typically <laughs> does happen, though. <laughs> I've watched TV. <laughs> I've, had, I've scrolled the market, online marketplaces for just more shit to buy. <laughs> yeah. um, mostly just Discogs. Just been scrolling for records. <laughs> Amazing. My, my first European tour was obviously flying, and I brought so many books. Yeah. I didn't read a single one of them. I think I read, like, maybe 15 pages of one of them, but I had brought, like, I think three to four books for a three-week tour, thinking I was going to read every day, and did not happen. Yeah, one, one a week. One a week's a good rule, and I've, I've learned they, they feel really nice when you fall asleep with them on your chest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to read this. Let me doom scroll for a little bit first, mm-hmm. and then I fall asleep, and I wake up with a book in someone else's bunk. <laughs> <laughs> Books are better than bus vipers, but we won't. But we won't go into bus viper territory. Uh, this is a Vox and Hops episode. Vox and Hops is all about hanging with my metal friends, talking about their lives and music while drinking craft beer. I wanted to have a craft beer right now with you, but it's locked up. It's it's all here. We have seven amazing breweries on site. Uh, they brought seven amazing products. We have IPAs. We have uh, lagers. We have a red ale. We have a Belgian porter. I'm damn stoked to uh, be sharing beer with you soon, but we're not there yet. Um, take me back to your first beer. Do you remember the first beer you ever drank, Danny? The first um, beer that was created outside of the macro territory is not my current favorite beer, but I remember being at a gas station on a different tour when I was very, very young, different project, and there was that arrogant bastard. Yeah. And I just remember the bottle caught my eye because I didn't know that like, craft beer existed. I didn't know that any beers outside of the typical brands existed, so I, I thought it was funny. It was a gag. We bought it. I thought it tasted terrible. <laughs> um, years later, very I, bitter, though. That's I would fine. end up brewing for them. And really, it, it, yeah, that's so this is why to, James Wright wanted that. me to have a chat for you. That's now everything's coming back to me, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that so was, you brewed, you went to school and you brewed for Arrogant Bastards, Stone Brewing, yeah. I brewed for Stone for a little bit, I, I brewed at a bunch of different places for a while, and then I started making all the moves to open up my own little place. And then towards the end of that process, everything sort of fell apart, and I realized that the industry wasn't something that I wanted to involve myself in to the level of immersing my life fully. So I realized I enjoyed a lot more as an enthusiast, as a hobbyist, and then ruined my life with music instead. <laughs> <laughs> the, the craft beer in this industry is extremely cutthroat and difficult and... You know what? Sometimes it works, and then sometimes it doesn't, and it's it's inexplicable why certain breweries pop off. So so good for to you for stepping out before ever getting in that deep. Um, what do you drink now? If it's something that you are going towards, you, you're, the arrogant bastard's gone. I heard uh, rumors that the bus is packed with Bud Light, but that's okay. You know what? Sometimes you just want thirty or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually tend to. I have a really nice cellar at home. I pretty much mostly drink Lambics. Nice. At home. Big, big Belgian fan in general. Nice. Not just Lambics, but um, I do love all the Trappist beers as well. And I think if I were to sit down at night and they allowed me one beer a night, it would probably be, you know, like a Fontana or Cantillon or something like that. And just to keep it easy and... Kind of uh, wine esque yeah. on the commodity side. Hansen's, I love Hansen's so much. Mm. Whoa. <laughs> Well, you're in the right place. You're in the right city tonight because this is Brutal Montreal. It is my metal and beer fest. Uh, across the town, another craft beer metal god is playing uh, with Carcass and Municipal Waste. Of course, I'm talking about Dave Witty. He's coming out tonight. He also loves Belgian beer very, very much. So so uh, hopefully maybe we could find something somewhere later. That would be very cool. 
the rumors when 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 you found out that there was a beer fest today, which I know what being on tour is every day feels the same, and then all of a sudden then the day is a little bit different. What was your first impression of of stepping into Montreal and it being brutal Montreal? Um, I well, we got held up at the border longer than we should have, which is fine. We expected. So when we got here, there was less time to kind of roam around and get all of the the more touristy side of things done because I like getting the touristy side done early and then get into the fun a little later on. So I think that the the brutal Montreal side it starts now. Good. Get a lot of catching up to do. I also, <laughs> I also really want to try to make carcass later. Hell yes! I don't so know so it's the flip. It's the, really the flip of what Dave Woody's wanting to do. It's gonna, you guys are going to like <laughs> see each other passing in in separate cabs, going <laughs> or Ubers. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Talk to me about Montreal. What does Montreal mean to you? This is a heavy MTL presents episode. The event is presented by them. They are the promoter. Uh, what what does Montreal mean to you? There's um, a very, I think one of my favorite parts. Of any time we've been up here is, is just the, the the openness of culture here, the access to multiple cultures here that we don't really have access to in a lot of places close to home, and it just has such a high quality standard or a high standard of quality for what it does. Like food, for example, the food up here is out of control. All the food up here is just bonkers. And there's so many restaurants that I've never had a chance to go eat at. Um, I mean, around the corner, there's that, uh, what's it called? St. Elizabeth's, the, the pub? Or yeah, something. exactly. St. Elizabeth's pub is killer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I've, I've never had a chance to go there because we've never been near there. So I'm excited to go there later. Uh, I know there, are, uh, there there's a lot of other places that I won't get to make it to this time, but it's just there's too much, I guess is what I'm saying is. You have to it's pick just, one thing each time. You have much. to overindulge <laughs> in one thing each time. That's that's the secret to to, to getting through. Uh, and then you have something to look forward to next time. And that's right? the thing is that when you get it all done in one trip, that's like fine. I'll move on. But you're never gonna get it done here. No. <laughs> And because every time I come, there's something new. Mm, that's true. I'm like, oh, shit. I missed the old one, and I'm gonna miss the new one. <laughs> So, how about this? It's overwhelming. <laughs> that's, that's my experience here. <laughs> you mentioned it that you brought a bunch of uh, writing materials. The first thing when I started listening to your records was the lyrics. The lyrics are so fucking powerful. It's like almost every lyric, every song has at least two or three lines that from a death metal standpoint, I'm like, that could be a back print. That could be a back print. The power of lyrics. Uh, how important is it to be a songwriter versus just someone that I, I, t I imagine the lyrics are always first for you and then everything is built around it, which is completely different from most artists nowadays. It's an afterthought. So, so putting lyrics to the forefront is, is something that comes naturally to you, but how important is that to you and where does that come from? I think the lyrics are what build the final landscape. It's the, the final trimming for the, for the beauty of the landscape. And, and in my opinion, there's nothing more important to songwriting than the actual story being told, whether it's linear, whether it's poetic, whether it's abstract, it doesn't matter what type of poetry it is. Lyrics are the final glue. Um, they're the, I usually start with a story. And I'll get a, a draft of the story down, kind of build the song around that story. And then I'll go back and start reworking the lyrics to where they have a little more depth to them. And usually that comes off as way more pretentious than it should. And I'll go back, rewrite the song part again so that it fits that structure. Interesting, yeah. And then I do a third pass of the lyrics where I take away the really annoying parts. <laughs> and I try to make them accessible mm -hmm. uh, to my own thought process so that they don't sound like I am using words that I wouldn't normally use. Okay. So it's because, a layman, it's really your identity absolutely. coming out on the paper, out in the songs. Because I think it's really easy when you're trying to use these two, three layered metaphors to start using different perspectives or different, uh, just terminology in general. It's so easy to get lost in someone else's thoughts, essentially. 
that once it becomes someone else's, like truly someone else's, by using phrases you wouldn't use, then you lose that connection to yourself as well. So it can be this beautiful poetry. I mean, someone like Leonard Cohen, for example. Yes. I, oh, I will say I felt like such an idiot. I was walking around earlier and I was like, oh, I was just strolling and I was looking <laughs> up and I was like, I wonder if Leonard Cohen's been here. He, he, he has. <laughs> um, but it was the consistency in his poetry became how he spoke. It became very tied to who he was as a human being and how he related to the imagery. That's not me. I'm not that poetic. I'm not that... Uh, I don't have that finesse. For me, I'm just a fucking idiot who stumbles through ideas and sometimes they work. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what I hope comes across in those final moments of the, the simplicity of the concepts, no matter how, how much depth there is. So I also do try to make every song double layered, at least to where what whatever it is at the face of it doesn't have to be this the guts of it exactly and it's open to interpretation from multiple standpoints which your audience then can interact and connect with the song in different ways which is super important too i think it becomes theirs at that mm. point and, and that to me is more important than having anything for myself you definitely are a very vulnerable artist i see you as that someone that's just basically slitting his wrists and and showcasing it to the crowd i think it's easier <laughs> it's a lot more easy than people think people you know have that internalization that that wall that they're scared anyone else is going to learn to climb and ah fuck it just let go who cares People see you sad. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, let's be vulnerable. I like that. It just doesn't matter. I talk about it on the podcast a lot. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's, it's it's easier because it opens up a lot of dialogue as well. You make a lot of more friends. You you allow people to understand that you know, this facade, this bullshit wall thing, doesn't work anymore. It's just building barriers. I've been talking a lot about mental health on the podcast, and this is a perfect jump-off point right there. So, so how do you deal with moments when you're in the darkness? Well, where do you drag yourself out with? Is it through your writing? Is it, is it through connecting with the audience? Where, what, what do you do to make yourself feel better when you're feeling vulnerable? I think through different phases of my... Um, not to generalize it, but genuinely can say through through different phases of depression so i've always had something near and dear to my heart that is on the on the depression timeline i've learned that every answer i've ever thought i had changes yeah. as time goes on with the seasons with who i'm surrounded by um sometimes you know if if my partner is in a good place she always tries to be there for me. She always does, and she always is. But I have also realized that there are moments where I've relied on that help that has been a burden to her more than a help to me. And that's not her fault. That's, that's mine because, you know, I, I shouldn't... I realized in that moment that I shouldn't be relying on someone else completely as a tool to get myself out of something. The moments that she has had the ability to, to be there for me in a good timeline and it, and it, it kind of works out. It's, it's, it's a great help and resource that includes friends, that includes family. Um, but I think more importantly, the realization that multiple tools, it's, it's a whole chest of tools. It's a whole, it's a whole collection that you have to gather over time, not just a simple... Well, I sit in a dark room for 20 minutes and <laughs> meditate. Like, that's not going to work every time. No. Sometimes you're going to find every fucking problem that you're trying to run away from or conquer or overcome in that room. Mm -hmm. and but another never... time it will work perfectly. Exactly. Interesting. So um, the only consistent activity, if you'll call it an activity, 
at this point, it's a hobby. Another hobby. You know, beer's a hobby. Battling depression's a hobby. <laughs> we got <laughs> the multifaceted, faceted parts of Danny. I like that. Um, at this point, I think that a lot of it ha- has to do with listening to the internal clock and the internal dialogue, where your body will, for the most part, tell you what it is you have to do. And I feel like that's where the the, the cloud, that obscurity of the, the the I don't even know how to ever explain that feeling, but I know that everyone who does feel it knows it. You can see through, but you can't make out anything on the other side. And I've learned that the less I try to identify what's on the other side, the more quickly that glass or that wall begins to clear up. And that's where I think listening to your instinct, your internal clock, your internal dialogue comes into play where it's all in my mind, in my personal life, because we all deal with things differently. It's all about letting go of control. I think trying to control your emotions, trying to control your narrative, trying to be in control at all times is detrimental. Because we're all animals, basically. We're just feral. Yeah. Let yourself be feral. <laughs> just go fucking nuts. <laughs> but, yeah. We're, we're, you know, we're highly evolved animals. That, we are. That live in our heads probably a bit too much and not enough in our guts. Oh, people always say, you know, well, we're humans because we have reasoning and logic. Fuck. We're depressed because we have reasoning and logic. <laughs> we're not. We're we're not thriving because we have reasoning and logic. It's it's that instinct that we let go of so long ago because we think we're so smart, we have control, and we know everything. Nah, man, just fucking let go. Your body knows what to do. Mm, trust, trust, and, and sometimes doing nothing is is what needs to be done. Well, those those are strange. I don't remember what's from. And I'm sure I'm going to botch a little bit of it, but there was one, I'll, I'll try to make it very quick because it was long. Somebody was defining um, the true definition of living, or, you know, being alive. And we always say, you know, live your best, do everything you can to just live to the fullest extreme. And when you break it down to a very basic level, but just, just definitions. Every single thing that we do to live our fullest life is technically the opposite. (laughs) Because to be alive is a very simple concept. Mm -hmm. Everything we do is technically to avoid remembering that we're alive. Working hard, having these fun pastimes, making friends, going out and having experiences... None of that is really living at its basic core. It's the, the avoidance of the moment, yeah. of the moment of just filling something other than life, right? The most basic version of it, the, the definition of being alive is a fucking cow in a field eating grass for four hours doing nothing. <laughs> like when's the last time any of us just sat mm-hmm. and stared at a wall for four hours? Well, we were satisfied doing it. And just that is that is the most pure version of being alive. Mm. Is genuinely just you are doing nothing but being alive. <laughs> it's true. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't have fun. <laughs> you know, that's the, the or point ambitions of life. or goals. Exactly. But if you're having darkness or, or just, just depression issues, and maybe you need to scale back your. I think it's maybe be aware that a lot of times we use those excuses of make the best of life as an escape mechanism rather than fulfillment. And I think that if we find that core of being truly alive, just you're living, doesn't matter if you do something or not. Your heart's beating, your lungs are inflating, deflating, whatever the hell they do. I don't know about lungs. <laughs> I thought I did until, I, until it came out of my mouth. <laughs> it feels like that's what we're doing. They're like balloons, right? Yeah, they yeah. kind of feel like balloons. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
let your balloons go, you know? <laughs> I'm doing this new segment called Fight the Hops, where I ask my guests um, a very small goal, an obtainable goal, something that you've set, something you're working on right now that you hope to accomplish within the next month or two. What are you doing right now to fight the hops? I am... Uh putting together a book of poetry no way That's yeah. a, that makes a lot of sense obviously yeah yeah it, it seems um well i mean by putting together it's uh, i'm kind of just finding all you these must, things you must have so many things written yeah so much and i forget about a lot of it so i've been going through old notebooks i've been going through just my little notes and computers and all that and i've been collecting all the bits and pieces that that I still find accessible to whatever state I'm in at the moment. Is there things like that that you find and then you're like, oh, I can't read this right now. I can't go back to that. I think there are things I read that I feel sorry for the moment I was in. Yeah. Where I, I feel sorry for the version of me that was yeah. in that moment. Yeah. And usually those are moments I don't want to relive. Yeah. So there's no point to let Publish them live. Shows or, yeah. <laughs> So I'm trying to put that together just as a reminder that a reminder for myself more than anything that um, the lyricism isn't the only part of writing that I enjoy because I do forget that a lot. I get so stuck in writing Is there songs. some pressure? Yeah, that, that, that you get, especially when, I guess when it's album cycle time or that, and then do you disdain? Do you not want to write after those periods or is it refreshing to write once you've handed in an album? It's refreshing in the sense of liberation from duty, mm -hmm. but I think it is uh, terrifying because even as I write something post album, I go, "That should have been. That could have been good. That yeah. would have been better on the record. <laughs> that would have been a better line for that on yeah. the record." That's so a, it's that's it's annoying. not it's yeah. not purity, you know. Because <laughs> um, we did just finish the new record like five days ago. Oh, congrats! So you finished the record and they jumped on a tour bus. Yes. Good for you. Hours later. Good for you. And we did it all ourselves. Is that the first time you've done that too? First time ever. It's the first time ever for everything. I love this. It was so crazy. We uh, we decided last minute there were some hiccups with the, the studio that we were going to be recording at. Uh, nothing bad, just general hiccups. And we said, why don't we just take the budget, get the gear. Just fucking do it ourselves. Wow. And we started two, three days later. And luckily, you know, Jason and, and Carson know the technical side of it, so they were able to set everything up. And then just twist the knobs. Just what does this do? What does that do? We recorded everything at my house. That's so cool. We used different rooms to get different organic tones. It's dead. So the, the album is even more you. Yeah. Like this, we have a, I have a bar at the house. Of course they do. And it's all, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's all wood. So it's like a taxidermy bar. I set it up like an old Belgian bar. Amazing. Yeah. And it's all old wood paneling, wood floor, but then the ceiling is all tin. It's a big tin. So it ceiling. sounds super interesting. Well, we did all the drums and percussion in there and all the amps were set up in there. It sounds really cool. I don't know why. I thought it was going to sound horrible because just, brrr, but it didn't rattle and it brought a warmth and reflection I didn't expect at all. So that's sick. A pure, pure record from yourself, slitting even deeper oh, into yeah. your wrists for the fans. Oh, the guts out on this one. It's crazy. The wrists are gone. <laughs> There's nothing. Left. We're all about guts. <laughs> Uh, the the book of poetry back to that sorry um, are you going to self release it is it something that you want to get published um, I imagine people would be interesting interested because the lyrics are so damn strong I'll probably sell it as merch to be honest <laughs> <laughs> it seems like the easiest way to go it about is it an easy <laughs> one uh, I've also I've, I've been writing a lot writing a lot a lot and I want to get back into brewing yeah I just haven't had time because we've been on tour so much have you ever made an amigo the devil beer I have, um, a few breweries have done fun little one-offs. Like somebody did, uh, we have a song, Hell and You. So one. Hellas. And Hellas and You. Um, we did a Jonestown Punch. Nice. Once. 
we we did a secondary fermentation with with flavor aid cool oh, flavor yes. aid uh, we call it jim jones knockout punch <laughs> people didn't like that <laughs> I had this one beer a long time ago. Everyone got mad at me for at one of the breweries that I was working at, and it was a, a goes a goza, and uh, I did prickly pear. Yeah. So it had this kind of red sheen on yeah. it. Yeah. And I named it Old Yeller Goza Behind the Shed. Oh shit! And everyone went, "You can't do that." <laughs> you know what? I did. You're you're right. You're right though. <laughs> but I'm gonna. <laughs> Damn, there's people crying. It's the tears. It's the it's saltiness the of the, the goza. Of the tears. It gets salty. I just, I, 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 I miss that. I miss that side of it. I miss the creativity of oh, brewing. I love it. It's the only thing I do. I love the branding, the, oh. the names, uh, what goes into it. I, I just hang out and drink beer while other people brew the beer. It's amazing. Yeah. Because the brewing part's not fun. It's like cooking. It's just, just cleaning. You're, you're basically a, a yeast. You're a yeast warden, sort of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're just in charge of cleaning up and keeping this thing alive. That's basically. It. Which we love. We appreciate I, the yeast wardens out there. God, listening. I worship the yeast. Number the yeast. <laughs> That's a good one, too, yeah. How about the yeast would be good? That'd be good, like, yeast name, a metal-themed yeast provider. That'd be really fun, <laughs> actually. Uh, you are always, like, like branded and packaged. Not necessarily branded, but packaged as, like, an extreme act because of the lyrics and stuff. So you fit in on metal tours, but you fit in elsewhere as well. Is that something that was purposefully, or is it just it's yourself and it's who you are? You're wearing an Escuela grind shirt right now, so so obviously you like the extreme music. But you could be packaged with anything as long as people aren't necessarily listening to the lyrics. I feel like I, I, I mean, coming from the world of... That's just the world I, I come from growing up. So when I started writing that kind of, um, I hate using the word dark because it's so brooding and dramatic, but the, the, the bar for the content is much less extreme in my mind. Yes. Yes, no, I understand what you mean. Like, yeah. I don't think it's that crazy. Yeah. I think a lot of the songs are, are they're not that crazy. But then people they're hear not them. that far from like a cryptopsy record. We're, 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 we're definitely in the same territory, lyrical thematics. Yeah, thematics, I, I feel it's. I just forget that other people's bars and other genres are not That's the true. same. So when they hear a certain lyric, where in our world, generalize people go okay that's a lyric <laughs> other i'll, I'll in, buy in that other, shirt with that on it exactly. the back. yeah you know in other worlds people go oh my god my heart you can't say that we gotta ban this record burn it like, what yeah. the fuck are you talking about that's not even that bad <laughs> don't listen to this song <laughs> i remember even something as simple as when i a husband the chorus is silly it's stupid it's a joke song I hope your husband dies mm -hmm. and it's just about being in love with somebody who is Married. not accessible yeah. it's not a bad lyric but people that don't listen to or are not associated with anything relatively outside of the you know the norm the, the, the norm they hear that they go Oh, curses, get away, you, you can't say that, you can't wish harm on anyone. I'm like, yes, you fucking can. You do also like to play with um, religious themes. Yes, a lot. It's something that, and like being coy with it. So that also rubs people the wrong way. Very wrong. Yeah. More so than anything. For sure. I feel like I could, in, in great detail, describe <laughs> the hilarious dismemberment of somebody. And it would be less shocking than if I said, Jesus is boring. <laughs> and they just treat that like the end of the fucking world. See, that'd be a good back print, too. <laughs> just, just as simple as that. You know, it's not even, you didn't even say anything bad. You just said, it's kind of boring. He's not for me. <laughs> it ain't my thing. <laughs> I don't think we'd get along. Or we would. I don't know. It's probably a great conversational list. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Probably better than all his fucking followers. <laughs> but, 
sorry. <laughs> 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 I'm stoked for having this conversation. We're going to keep hanging out. Uh, you guys should have been here. I hope you were here at Brutal Montreal 2023. Um, I'm going to wrap up with the classic Vox and Hops wrap-up question, but I see it right here on the table, which is amazing. And when I walked in, I noticed it. I saw it upstairs. There's a bottle at your merch booth already uh, that's half drank just about. Apparently, there's more on the bus. Uh, what is your hangover cure? Now, I will use this brand because it's here, but I will say it doesn't have to be this specific brand. Pedialyte. Mm-hmm. We, uh, we usually have four, six, eight bottles a night. <laughs> and that also, cause we also go through a lot of, a lot of booze. And somehow, I think it fights off the bloat. It fights off the, fights off a lot of things. I just don't feel bad ever because of that little miracle saline bomb. I think that's all it is, right? Just salt. It's like salt and electrolytes, they say, and yeah. sugars, I think. I have one in my fridge all the time. It's for the kids, I tell my wife. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I had one, a Kinder Light, I think, was the one I had the other day that was really nice. I'd never had that one before. But any type of electrolyte solution has been a damn... Just hero. That is the hero of the tour. And what <laughs> Especially I usually now do, that you're not driving. Exactly. Because now I get to sit in the back, everyone goes to sleep, and I just watch 90 Day Fiance for seven hours. Yes. Crushing tequila and Pedialyte. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's the, the yin and the yang. It's, it's yeah, amazing. It smells. <laughs> they do go nicely together. A nice, a nice little... Tequila with some Pedialyte. It's not bad. Danny, thank you so, so much for taking the time. Hanging out here backstage at MTELUS here in Montreal, at Brutal Montreal. Uh, I'm stoked to see your set. I uh, have lots of friends that wrote me that were like, You're, I, I have to come, so I'm, I'm, I can't wait for Montreal to enjoy you. I'm going to be there. We're going to drink some beers after because I'm going to find the person with that key. Done. Cheers. Thank you for your time. John Paul, how are you doing? You just wrapped up Brutal Montreal. This is a weird thing. Um, you're on tour. I've been on tour with Cryptopsy. I know what it's like. You get into a routine, and then all of a sudden you step into a city, and some promoter comes up with this idea that it's going to be a festival. It fucks everything up. The routine is off. What was your mindset stepping into Brutal? Was it something you understood? Was it, was it just something crazy? Uh, I, th- I think we understood that there was beer involved, and so that was that uh, was the reason why that was the, why we're worked. here today. <laughs> Talk to me about beer. I've had Neil on before. Um, I feel like we wrapped up our chat, and hypothetically during the episode, he told me that I should have had the episode with you because you apparently are the clutch beer guy. Is that the truth? I have a great appreciation for beer. For beer, I can I can tell you that for sure. Um. I love craft beers, and I, and I love the idea of people um, taking just a very few ingredients and uh, paying attention to the details and creating something that's unique to themselves. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, th- there is art in that, I think, in the same way that, you know, we make music or paint or, or sing or do whatever else we do. Simple things to create unique things. That is the the essence of art. Yeah, I think it's all in, in, in all the nuances, and and also it's it's about um, you know having appreciation for what came before you. You know, there are so, there are some styles of beers or some beers that are iconic in some ways, and uh, I, I think there's nothing wrong with taking inspiration from you know things that have been around us since we were very young. You know. Here we are at Brutal. You are enjoying a Overhop Canada Hazy, uh, which is a very cool brewery from here. They're actually from Brazil. They won the Mondial de la Bia, which is the World Beer Fest in Brazil, back in the mid to 2010s. And when you win that competition, you get invited to Mondial de la Bia here in Montreal. And they came, and then they enjoyed their experience, and they loved Montreal so much that they moved here, and then they opened 
opened Overhop Canada, and now you're drinking a Hazy, which is their basically their flagship beer, which is a New England IPA, 6.5%. Vox and Hops make a bunch of beers with Overhop Canada. I love them to death. Talk to me about your very first beer. Uh, my very first beer. I, th- I think my very first beer would have had to have been with my dad, and that would have been a Stroh's. Yeah. And um, so he would keep those around. Um, I remember especially, you know, g- growing up in Maryland, we eat a lot of crabs in the summertime. And uh, part of that tradition is having a beer with your crabs. And I can, I can remember being pretty young. I don't know, 12 or 13 or something like that. And my, my pop saying, here, Today's you, the need, day. you need to have a beer with your crabs. Um, so, you know, for, for me, uh, you know, beer, beer was pretty great pretty early on. <laughs> 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 were you the kid like that everyone like gravitated towards because they knew that you can get access is that something that was possible um, you know not really because we had beer around it really wasn't a big deal and uh i you know there were other kids i remember growing up that used to make a real big deal about you know getting getting beer or stealing beer from the their folks or liquor or whatever and that wasn't it wasn't really like that in our household it was pretty open and you know um my my dad would let me have a beer every once in a while so it wasn't like a, a a big deal. It wasn't illicit. It was. It was just a part of life. I think by the time I, I could actually buy beer, though, I, I had developed an appreciation for beer that wasn't Budweiser or yeah. you know Coors or your your you know sort of mass produced beers. And at that time, um, Sierra Sierra Nevada or Sam Adams were sort of the main breweries that would be able to um, you'd be able to find. And at that point, we were actually just starting to tour. So we're talking about 1994, 1995. So, you know, we're just starting to go around the country. And this craft beer thing is sort of just starting to take off. Um, so we were really excited if we could get uh, some some local stuff. You know, I remember getting Black Butte Porter in the early days. And uh, there were some great beers in Southern California. I remember getting... Um, but it would be rare, and for the most part, you know, it, the the standard issue would be uh, Sam Adams Ale, and it was probably five or six months old because no one in Topeka, Kansas, drinks that shit anyway. <laughs> they're, not, they're not checking. The, 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 they're not checking and turning over their stock. No, no, they're not. <laughs> they're not. But you know, that, that was kind of the that was the beginning of it. You got to check your beer, people. You got to make sure your beer is fresh. It, it gets old, and, and, and not everyone understands that, but you should, people. You should. For me, you know, th- that's the most important thing, fresh and local. You know, p- people, will, people say, well, what is your favorite style? And, um, you know, I'm, these days I'm not too picky. I just want something that's, that's, that somebody's uh, taken time to, to create, and I want it to be fresh, and I want it to have local ingredients. And if you can, if you can check all those boxes, chances are you're going to get something that's pretty delicious. It's an art. It's, it's heart and soul. There's a lot that goes into beer. It's like cooking. There's It's a science behind it. Take me to music, your first live show. Do you remember the first band you went to go see play? Yeah, that, that probably would have been uh, ZZ Top. Wow. Uh, I just saw them last year. Yeah, yeah. yeah the ZZ Top is great. Uh, that would have been in 1984. That would have been the Afterburner tour. Um, yeah, the, I, I love the songs and I, and I love the band before I went. I, I hadn't really considered the idea of playing music. Um, and even then, after I saw them, it, I just thought that was something that, you know... That it was, was just suspect. Why were you there? What, what, what made you go to the show? Um, be, because... Uh, this very pretty girl uh, <laughs> said, "Hey, my dad. My dad's got two tickets. Wow, okay. ZZ Top, and uh, would you, would you like to go? Would you like to go?" And I said, "Of course, I would." And um, so she she was great, and her her, her old man took us to the concert uh, with one of her girlfriends, and we saw ZZ Top and Michael Shanker group opened up. It's sick. It was sick. It was yeah, totally freaking sick. Real guitar work there. Um, but it, when I saw that show, it was it was sort of it was something that I thought was completely unattainable, you know, because the stage was huge and the people that were there. I mean, it was just it was enormous. It was it was uh, overwhelming in a way, and I very much enjoyed it. But I didn't I didn't for a second think that that would be something that I could do because that was, I mean, those guys were superhuman in my opinion. 
I agree. Yeah, I remember coming to this venue for the first time, looking around at that dome ceiling of the, we're talking about Amtelis. In my day and age, we call it Metropolis, and here we are tonight. I'm hosting an event in this thing. It's these weird things that happen. The unattainable becomes attainable. Your first time on stage. Do you remember your first show? Um. Yeah, we kind of, I think maybe our first shows were a little bit uh, anticlimactic in that they weren't really proper venues. They were more just sort of, uh, yeah, they were kind of like uh, just bars. Um, I think probably the the first time we played a show where I really thought, oh, wow, we've got something going was when we played at the 930 Club in Washington, D.C. The 930 Club at that point was a um, was on F Street. It's not where the current location is. Um, this was a this was a club that that had been around for probably ten or twelve years at that point. So I'm talking about like 1988, 1989, and seeing shows there was was incredible to me because those the people on that stage, I saw myself in them at least to some degree. Because there was close. There was a possibility. Exactly. This wasn't you know this wasn't uh, this wasn't a basketball arena. Now this is a this is a 400 cap venue and that concert experience was completely different and so probably the first show that i saw at the 930 club would have been fugazi um and i think shutter to think opened and th- that for me was uh, that a uh, kind of a turning point you know I, I i thought to myself okay i i can i can i can do this i can play music and, and maybe one day get on that stage why, why the drums what what gravitated you towards the drums um i think maybe to some degree my my, my father had something to do with that my he, he was not a musician but he had a an appreciation for uh for music for sure um he loved the blues and he loved big band music and country music um and I remember watching um, the Buddy Rich big band on public television with him because in our house, we did not watch sitcoms. We did not watch A disdain. Uh, no, sitcoms, no, there yeah. was none of that crap going on. Um, the public television was was channel 26. Higher education TV. Yeah. And and um, we would try to watch, you know one of these whatever sitcoms was on at the time and my dad would just walk in the room and he'd be like he he would say channel 26 it <laughs> and that just meant you had to watch whatever was on public tv you want to watch tv you're gonna watch channel 26 you gotta, you gotta watch channel 26 <laughs> so i remember watching the buddy rich big band with him and being totally blown away by by buddy rich he seemed superhuman to me um and I think maybe that that kindled something there. Well, what I, I consider you a drummer's drummer, and uh, that's a compliment, and I hope that you take it as one. There's like two drummers that drove across town that were playing at another venue to come hang out and watch you play drums tonight. You're basically a drummer's drummer. What does that mean to you? Uh, I, yeah, I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, I, I can tell you that um, you know I, I I very much enjoy playing drums. It's 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 what I do. Uh, you know, all day, every day. It's the first thing I think about and the last thing I think about. You play drums all the time. Uh, At least in my head. (laughs) Dave Whitty's here tonight. He told me that he writes parts uh, for his, he bikes around his town to write his drum parts. Drums are in his head all the time, too. That's amazing. I I was kind of nervous having those guys out there tonight, (laughs) actually. It's funny how that plays on us. Yeah. Knowing who's in the room when we play to thousands of people all the time, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I was trying to But when that one person walks around, the worst part is when you know where they are. (laughs) That nerve. I I saw him up there and I thought, man. (laughs) You got got Dave McLean and Dave Witte up there just eyeballing me. Yeah, a drummer's drummer. It means something. There's something to that. To 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 when when other drummers idolize someone. I'm in a band with Flo Munye, so I've lived my whole career with with people idolizing my drummer. So watching drummers, he's a drummer's drummer. Like people think that you're, you know, like hey, that's a good drummer. But being a drummer's drummer, it's something special. Something that hasn't been analyzed. I don't think yet. Yeah, perhaps not. Um. I don't know. I can't really comment on it. It's interesting. It's 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 more than like like there's the layman ear right. won't hear what a drummer will hear. Uh, so for for me, maybe when I think about a drummer's drummer, I think about Elvin Jones, 
and he's one of my favorite, very favorite drummers. And um, I, th I think maybe what is so interesting about him is that that um, that he he not only you know revolutionized uh, a genre jazz, but he 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 really had an impact on drums as a whole. Um, and I and I and I think in that way he was probably one of the, the most important drummers because if you listen to drummers before Elvin Jones and then you listen to drummers after Elvin Jones, he really um, he, he injected something completely new and you hear that in all of the drummers that happened, not, not just the jazz drummers, you hear it mm -hmm. you hear it in El, uh, you hear it in John Bonham and you hear it in Ginger Baker and Mitch Mitchell. It's like the ripple effect of yeah, inspiration. Exactly. Yeah. And, then, and, the, and, and those guys of course you know, resonated with another generation of drummers and so on and so on. I think as a drummer, it's really important to it, study where the music came from, you know, pick your favorite drummer and, and learn about the what, what that, that drummer contributed. Yeah. And, then, and then, and then learn about where that drummer got their ideas from, Yes, you know, and dig and dig a little more and then learn about where that drummer got his ideas from, you know, and then go back to the very, very beginning and just learn about that stuff. It's not to say that you have to be a jazz drummer or you got to learn how to play big band. But it's it's, it's 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 learn about the history of the instrument and understand why there's understand why there's a bass drum there and what the purpose was you know the percussion uh, why is the years percussion ago. yeah uh, what is the what is the purpose of this thing we call a hi hat why was it invented you know um, for me when I when I learn about the history of the instrument it makes it easier for me to play what I do now. How do you take all this knowledge that you've gained over the years and create something unique? for new songs, new material? How do you sign it, John Paul? How, how do you make it yours? You just, you, you don't, first of all, you don't think about it too much. You, you just, you pick some stuff that you like and you listen to that stuff, you know? Speaking for myself, I, I, um, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, so uh, go-go music had a, an enormous influence on, on just how I hear stuff. Um, and I would I would listen to go-go music and I would try to play along to those drummers and I would do the same thing with Jimi Hendrix and Black Sabbath and Bill Ward and you know you just you 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 take the time to, to uh, listen to what the player uh, records and what what he's thinking and you try to take some of those ideas and you incorporate them and you try to make them your own you know um, everything comes from something and that's something that there's no sense of identity that that plagues you. That you 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 are very proud to encompass other people's ideas and and that put packaging together and just what's best for the song. Absolutely, you know, you 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 listen to your your heroes and then you you try to emulate them and you just be true to yourself and what comes out comes out. You know. Uh, Sometimes I, I do a thing and I'll, I'll be like, well, I want to try to make it sound like Elvin. And there's no way in hell it's ever going to sound like <laughs> Elvin. Just, it's going to just sound like me. But, yeah. but that's just me trying to do an Elvin kind of a thing. Um, and ultimately it just comes out and it's just it's your own voice. And if you just take the time to um, to to listen to those to, to the those drummers that really gave you inspiration and, and take time to practice too. learn the technique, understand why why things sound different when you hit them differently. Mm. Uh, take the take the time to uh, analyze the instrument. Yeah, yeah. Man, you got you know take the you time. You got to play it. a little bit, like play in like a, a playful sense, not as opposed to actually play the drums. T take the time to to uh, learn the instrument and 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 put yourself in the instrument and. Only good stuff comes from that. Do you think that, and this could be like just a crazy question, with vocals, it's never ending. I, I, I seem like these kids, Will Ramos, as an example, he's the singer of Lorna Shore, and he's probably the most extreme, extreme vocalist at this moment. He's like pushed the level so far. Do you think that the human body can go even more extreme or more intense or is there going to be some new drum techniques um identities that are going to be built over the next few years that are humanly capable not digital i watch drummers all the time on uh on, on youtube that have incredible technical proficiency you know whether they're in extreme metal bands 
or um, you know whether they're in the you know a modern jazz band or gospel players. You know, there's 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 people out there who have immense facility. Um, the thing that that excites me is when you can hear a person's personality in their drums. Yeah. You know, and you know for, for that reason, um, a, a drummer like Buddy Miles for me will will just endlessly resonate because you know Buddy Miles was not a person who you think of as having uh, incredible chops, but the musicality there is something that you that you can't touch, and so. At the end of the day, that's that's the thing that really that really resonates with me is being able to hear a person's personality in whatever they play, uh, whether it's guitar or drums or saxophone. A real personality, a human. Yeah, a real personality. A human touch. Yeah, I mean, practicing's great, and it's good to do all that stuff. You need to tend, you, you need to take the time to learn your instrument and and shed all that stuff. At the end of the day, though, you're playing music, and you have to, you know, make it make it make it feel good for yourself and make it good for the listener, the people who are there. You know, you make them feel good. Tonight, you play drums for Nate Bergman, DC area, Lion Eyes, long history between the, the two of you. How easy was that for you today to jump up? Super easy. I've known Nate Nate now for probably coming up on 20 years. Um. He's uh, he's someone I've collaborated with on um, a lot of projects in many different ways. Um, I think the thing that that most uh, impresses me about Nate is his ability to keep a great attitude regardless of whatever is going on, and he works harder than anybody I know, and he delivers more than anybody I know. Uh, it was a it was a thrill and and an honor to be able to. To play with him tonight. That makes me happy. Um, heavy subject, but I like to broach it. I think it's important for the viewers to hear it. Um, mental health. What do you do when you're not feeling well? What is your tactic to get out of the dark? Oh, that's easy. Practice. Drums every time. Practice. Yeah, man. Take the time to practice. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I mean, real practice. I don't mean just like I, mean, don't, I don't mean playing. I mean. Challenging pick, yourself. Pick, yeah, pick a concept and really work on that. I like that for you're me, never satisfied. You just always for me, want to that's push meditation. Yourself. You know that uh, a lot of folks, a lot of folks talk about meditation. I don't know much about that, but I know about practicing, and I know that hypothetically, your brain falls into the same state of mind as people that are meditating when you are practicing. It. Um, You've done it for so long that it just—it's like a trance for you almost. Yeah. I have this new thing called Fight the Hops, where I ask my guests a short-term goal, something you're working on, you want to accomplish in the next two months. What is that? What are you doing to fight the hops? Um, short-term goal. You know, I've spent a lot of time uh, working out of books in the last... Um, like 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 tab- tabulature, but for drums. Yeah, yeah, you could call it that. Sure. Um, working out of books and being very cognizant of, of technique and, and, you know, how my body moves and what that feels like. And it's been, it's been really good. I started doing that during the pandemic. I started studying with a teacher named Dom Famularo and working with him was a game changer. And, um, so I, I learned. What, what was his technique that made you change? Your approach to learning drums. It's it's about uh, it's about playing in a manner that's completely relaxed and tension free. Yeah, and yeah. And it's it's still a challenge. It's not to say that I've arrived, but um, I've spent a lot of time working on that, and and so now I'm I'm just trying to just play, just just really just play on the drums and not think about too much about the technique because now I, f- I feel like I have a I kind of wrap my head around it a little bit, in a way. The muscle memory is strong. Two more questions. First one is about beer. The second one's also about beer. But the first one's about a beer collab. Now, you guys have done this before. New Belgium, you guys have made beers with. Talk to me about if you could make a new collab. What would that beer be? What style? Um, a name is too complex to figure out at this point. Uh, a dream brewery, hypothetically, but but what style of beer? Let's go with that. 
Uh, well, my go-to style is an IPA, you know, between six and seven percent. That's kind of my that's kind of my jam. This, this beer that we're having tonight is delicious. How about these guys right here? Let's, let's collaborate with them. I can make that happen very easily. <laughs> Patty, he wants a collab. That'd be that'd be that'd be sick, and that uh, and it'd be distributed across Quebec. People would be very happy. Final question, wrap up question, the classic Vox and Hops wrap up question. It probably doesn't happen to you very often because you are a master. You are one of the beer gods in rock and metal. Dave Woody is out there. He's the other beer god. I'm fighting and hashing my place out in the beer god level of metal what is your hangover cure uh two cups of coffee and 30 minutes on the elliptical machine oh yeah (laughs) damn that's brutal i mean when you feel shitty just get in there and just live it you know and then so you feel better afterwards that's sick john paul thank you so so much taking some time talking to me just finished your set, came downstairs, you were hanging out with the two Daves, I interrupted you, you came here, you drank a hazy from Overhop, I've been enjoying the uh, Belgian porter from La Patsicaille, which is also killer. Thank you so much, this has been a pleasure, I really, really appreciate it. Cheers, thank you for having me. Hey, what's up, everyone? Here we are backstage, Brutal Montreal 2023 with Gabriel uh, from Avenco for Heavy Montreal. He's repping Heavy Montreal tonight. Gabriel, how you doing? Very well. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, talk to me about Brutal. Uh, first time JF Michaud, who um, has been championing Vox and Hops for the past few years as the Heavy Montreal Presents Vox and Hops episodes, helped me create Brutal. He really did all the work, and I just sort of shoot ideas at him. When he mentioned Brutal to you, what is your first thought that came to mind? I mean, just the idea of mixing uh sort of micro brews with 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 live music with metal shows i mean it seems like it goes hand in hand we don't always have the opportunity in uh, in certain venues to have have a great beer selection uh so you know being able to have what do we have tonight seven micro brews there are seven micro breweries nine products being available to everyone i mean being able to sample a, a wide variety of shows uh, of uh drinks at a show like this i mean it's, it's an amazing combination i'm sure if you walk through the crowd you see some uh, some nice drunken happy faces i think it's uh i love it right so so i think it makes perfect sense montreal has a plethora of amazing musicians amazing bands amazing micro breweries what to tell everyone what are you drinking right now what are you uh degusting right now I've got a Le Fermentor. Is it St. Patrick? St. Patrick, yes. Shout out to my friend Pat, the vocalist of Reanimator that works at Le Fermentor. Uh, St. Patrick, it's him. It's his face. It's their Irish red ale. Um, 5%, I want to say. Yeah, 5%. 5%. I thought I would take it a bit easy tonight. Uh, you know, so you got some double IPAs at clocking in a bit much higher, 8, right? We do, right here. This is what I'm going to be drinking. This is Trailway Brewing Company, Who John Hops Heavy. Look at that. How, I can't even make this up. So, yeah, actually, actually I was going to ask you, so how many of these breweries here have connections to the music scene or actually to Montreal metal bands? It seems like most A lot of them. Of them. I would say at least 30 to 40 percent of them and if it's not directly involved in their employees first one that comes to mind obviously is Masora and Brassatorium ran by metalheads La Femme ran by metalheads Overhop has metal tendencies uh, my bassist works at Vice Versa it's, it, it goes all over the place and uh, Hoff and Stark uh, Fred loves loves metal so it's, it's very close to our heart um, I'm going to crack this double IPA from Trailway. Let's see, let's see what's going on here. It's cool. The story about Trailway is that uh, here in Quebec, they are now contract brewing via La Gabiaille, which is another one of the breweries that are here today because it would not be poss- possible because they're actually from um, New Brunswick Trailway. So take me to your first beer. Speaking of metal, uh, I want to say it was probably, it was definitely a 40 ounce, the old school yes. twist top cap. Yes. Black label, maybe? Damn, yeah. Speaking of metal, something, you know, that's what I thought that's what I thought you were supposed to drink at the time. It's, I'm sure it was disgusting. It was probably lukewarm. <laughs> probably Which, had probably drank a third of it and poured it down the drain and pretended I finished it. Yeah, at a party. I'm guessing, damn. I'm guessing that was probably the vibe. But uh, it's, it's pretty pretty nasty. It stuff. actually uh, kept me off beer for quite some time. I would actually, imagine actually. So. <laughs> I think I was I don't know, it's probably late. Probably sixteen. Maybe? 17? 16, 17? Getting into the music business, the the promotional side of things, what is your promoter story? I used to uh, 
uh, for a little while, book shows on my own, mostly in like the sort of like punk, pop punk, you know, Ramones inspired world. I was doing a few of those shows, mostly just bands I wanted to see. I did that uh, for a couple years and then uh, meandered into some more corporate jobs. And then I was able to swing back. I worked at uh, Greenland Productions for about seven, eight years and uh, their partners with us at Avenco on our club shows. So we, you know, we would work on uh, four to five hundred <laughs> club shows a year at Greenland, and Greenland has existed since, uh, for listeners who don't know, since the early '90s. So they brought, uh, you know, the Green Days here for the first time. Uh, ma- major, major acts and small, small clubs. Important shows for the Montreal scene. Yeah, and I was at those shows as a young yeah. teen as well. So to be able to work with those people full later circle. was full circle. Yeah. And now, yeah, now being on the Evenco side, still still in touch with that team, but uh, just a wider canvas for the types of shows that we can do or special events like we're doing with you. I think it's so cool to be here at MTELUS. People still call it Metropolis. Um, it's such an iconic venue. And when I found out Brutal 2023 was going to be here, I was just elated. What would be your favorite show that you ever saw, put on, or worked at here at Metropolis? Oh my gosh. Uh, Probably some of the best shows I've ever seen in my life are in this room, so I have a real soft spot for it. Um, I saw Radiohead Radiohead here right when OK Computer came out. Wow. It's a pretty legendary show, so you, you you could sense that we'd never see them in a club this size again. I think they did two or three encores until they literally ran out of songs they knew how to play and people still screamed while the lights were on so that was a pretty amazing show you know on the heavier side of things um when i was i think 13 years old i saw white zombie here wow. white zombie prong uh i forget who else actually but white zombie in their their heyday damn that's all well, for me you know probably like 94 maybe i have a chat with tommy coming up soon actually oh do you that's pretty amazing yeah uh oh, I, I i wouldn't even know where to begin or where to stop talking about shows. I mean, I, I, I saw Fugazi here when I was 13 years old. Uh, I found out it was all ages, and I pushed that to the limit, and it worked. 13-year-olds walking in here. That is something amazing game. about Montreal, like opening up and, and exposing culture, culture-forward city, having all-ages venues, exposing these children to this art, to this culture at such a young age. It, it's formative. So, so it's important that cities and venues do that. 100%. And we were lucky at the time that I found out about that show from the Montreal Mirror because it was in my house. My dad had it around and he said, oh, you should look through these ads. You're into music. There's a lot of shows happening. I think he assumed it would take me a few years to go, but I saw the words all ages. <laughs> Fugazi, $6. I was like, I've heard of that band. $6. $6, yeah. I yeah. saw the ticket stub for that show. Uh, I think that was 93. Uh, so that was, yeah, pretty formative, amazing experience seeing that band in front of... Yeah, it seemed like a pack room at the time, probably you know, 2,000 people. I'd never seen crowd surfing in real yeah. life. I'd never seen... Even though the band wasn't happy about that, but <laughs> I'd, I'd never <laughs> experienced that type of energy. And then I saw the Ramones pretty quickly after that here with my father shout out to my dad he took me to that show that's amazing i I begged him i I threw a temper tantrum and that that was 18 plus but we just walked in very quickly and no one seemed to wow maybe you have to edit that part no 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 good (laughs) it was many years ago good for your dad many years ago generally if you walk in with someone who looks considerably older i think at that time they would turn a blind eye it's the culture exposing the culture i like it very much um I want to go watch a bit of Amigo the Devil because I'm a big fan. I'm going to ask you one last question, the classic Vox and Hops wrap-up question. Probably doesn't happen to you very often. You seem put together, but every once in a while it happens to everyone. What is your hangover cure? I wish I knew because I need one. I'm getting older now and my hangovers, I don't know about you, but uh, they last. They're not a one-day affair. They're, they're not like fun, a, brutal things. They're brutal. Yeah, they're brutal. <laughs> B-R-E-W, yeah. Yeah. They, uh, they last me about, I want to say a solid two, three days when they come up now. So Damn. you got to get your salt in there. You know, if you've got some instant ramen in the house, to me, that's always been a, a lifesaver. The spicier, the better. Sweat it out. Yes. Uh, or just don't get hung over, kids. Just know your limits. That last drink when you're you're not sure, you're a little uneasy on the feet, put it aside. Give yourself drink 30 some mi- water. Give yourself 30 minutes. Have yeah. a little snack. See how you feel. I love it. <laughs> and then you pray to God. Yes. <laughs> As Danny just said, I hope that's on the mic. <laughs> Gabe, thank you so, so much for hanging out with of me. Of course, my this pleasure. This is amazing. I appreciate We're going to keep you. hanging out, but, you know, not with people listening. Cheers. 
Here we are. The show just finished. Everyone's stepping outside. How the fuck has Brutal Montreal 2023 been? The last time I saw these guys was 30 years ago. Fuck off. 30 years ago, Sepultra, Machine Head, Fudge Tunnel, Clutch. Wow. How's it going, bud? You know? Did it live up to the expectations? I'm sure you had a lot of expectations leading up to this. Uh, I totally did, but they 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 rammed through the expectations. I tell you what, uh, they were fantastic. They were fantastic. I'm glad you had a good time. I'm going to keep moving around. Thank you so much for having a chat with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you seem like a good dude. Uh, have a good night, buddy. Cheers, bud. You have a good time tonight? What's going on? Talk to me about tonight. What does Montreal mean to you? What Montreal means to us? It's the best fucking city to rock and roll, man. I'm, wrap, I'm wrapping up this Brutal Montreal episode in the crowd, talking to people. What was Brutal Montreal like for you tonight? Amazing. Perfect. Clutch is an amazing man. Best beer of Montreal was in the house. What else? What else? What, what else can we ask for? Thank you. That makes me feel good. I'm stoked. Thank you for being here. I'm stoked to hang out. Oh, Cheers, bud. One, Cheers. Walking around the venue. There's still a bunch of people just finishing off their beers. My favorite fucking place in the world, Metropolis, Montreal, recording a brand new fucking episode. Yes, you know whose face is that. I'm walking up to Paul Z, Wait, uh, Vox and Hops alumni episode, episode three, episode three, I want to say. Episode four, episode five. How you doing, Paul? Yeah, I'm doing great. Shoot, I just, I, I have to admit I got here a little late because I was working another show. I didn't know, like, honestly, I barely know Clutch, but while, while coming in and watching, like, the last, like, five songs, I'm like, I really need to get more into them because it was great. Hell yes, you're drinking a Le Fermatal St. Patrick, which is a hint as to whose face is on that. Obviously, it's Pat from Reanimator. Oh my god. <laughs> I didn't I didn't catch that at all. This is awesome. It's really tasty. Irish red ale. Very full body. Hell yes. Good to be with you. Stoked to see you. We got Jamari right fucking here. I'm recording the wrap-up episode. Brutal Montreal Jamari now plays bass for Fractitus. Vengeful guitar. The man behind it. He was almost in Cryptopsy. Jamari, how you doing? Doing all right, man. What was Brutal Montreal like for you? It was a great time. Here we are, live interview right now. Vox Pop with Elise, the the venue manager of M Telus, the person that puts up with all my shit when I say I'm gonna pull out all of her normal beers and only pack in the beers I choose. Elise, how you doing? Great, and I also had the luck to do the two first edition at the Corona Theater. I'm a big fan of Brutal. I'm a big fan of your good beers. I'm a good fan of you. Thank you for putting up all of my crazy ideas. That is true. It's the third time we do this together. Well, every time the magic operates, so it's fine by me. It works. It was, it was cool. I, I'm stoked. I'm stoked to see what happened and what's coming up. That's what's up. I need to go close all the bars now, and I'm not comfortable with a mic, but I'm comfortable with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Talk to me about your experience in Brutal Montreal. Talk to me about Clutch, Amigo the Devil. Fucking awesome time. We mom. Yeah. We went hard, you know? Yeah, and last yeah. time I see a clutch in Montreal, it's a uh, uh, cabaret, man, just for him. I'm going with the eyes, and second time I, I see that, and uh, it's, uh, it's awesome, it's awesome. Hell fucking yes. How about you? What do you got to say about tonight? Uh, this is my first time seeing Clutch, and they did not disappoint, and they left me wanting for more. Definitely wanting for more. Bang, bang. Fucking right, exactly. Yes. Fucking right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I am now approaching the lineup where Clutch fans are waiting to purchase merchandise. Here we are. I'm recording a live episode right now. Vox and Hops wrap-up of Brutal. You're waiting in line right now. 
for some clutch merch. Talk, talk to me about Brutal Montreal. Talk to me about clutch. Well, clutch is awesome, and they haven't been here in so long that uh, I couldn't believe it when I saw the announcement, you know? So I couldn't miss this. This, this was awesome. Fucking right. I'm stoked you were here. Thank you so much for being here. Support the band. It makes me happy. How you guys doing? Uh, recording a live interview, Vox and Hops. This is Brutal Montreal, Vox and Hops. How was the show? Did you enjoy the beers? Did you enjoy Clutch? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll translate. Go for it. No. The beers were really good. Uh, we're used to only have Budweiser, so it's good and improved. And the band was awesome, so awesome night. Thanks. Thank you guys. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. I think I'm good. How you doing? I'm good, man. My mouth, my beard, it's very wet. I've been drinking water like crazy. But basically, I uh, drank a couple beers. And I was enjoying the show very much. The band, oh my God, they sound exactly the same as they do on the album as they do live. How did you enjoy the show, my friend? I love I love these things. You know, this is this is my endeavor. I love bringing beer and metal together. I love watching people hydrate after a show. We got we got Dead End Follies here, hanging out after Brutal Montreal 2023. Well, ben, yes. You write reviews for the podcast. You you work for Urbania. Yes. You just witnessed Clutch Brutal Montreal 20. It's your first Brutal event, if I remember correctly. Okay. How was Brutal? I was awesome. It was great. Uh, fucking uh, clutch cl killed it all there. Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right today. And you know that I love and appreciate that. Man, this was an epic night. What a cool thing to do, to be there backstage, to be walking around, to be talking to everyone, to record an episode like this. I love doing stuff like this. I love connecting with multiple artists in one day and talking to the fans and talking to Vox and Hobsheads and getting their feedback. I love it to death. It's how the podcast started face-to-face -face backstage. Back in 2018, that's exactly how the podcast started. It feels right to do it again. Massive cheers to the whole Eventco crew, to Michelle Ayub, who I did not get a chance to have a chat with. She was running production of the show. Heavy Montreal, Clutch, Amigo the Devil, and Nate Bergman, all of the breweries. Massive cheers to all of you for being a part of Brutal Montreal 2023. I cannot wait to see what's coming up next for Brutal. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, you should sign up to the Vox and Hospital podcast mailing list. You can do that on my website, voxandhops.com. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S.com. And when you do that, you shall receive one email a week containing all of the details of everything that has happened in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal podcast. You'll get to see which episodes I drop. You'll get to see which episodes I have coming up. You will hear about any projects I have in the works before I announce them to the public, such as Pit Culture, my massive global beer collab, and Haze Wars, which is coming up this weekend, actually, at Kanawaki Brewing. You will also get to see which albums the Vox and Hops album review crew reviewed recently and you'll get to see which albums jerry monk vox and hops's metal architect has added to the brutal awakenings playlist there is always a lot of things going on in the world of the vox and hops metal podcast and i hate when you miss a single thing so please do me a favor and sign up to the mailing list the vox and hops metal podcast is brought to you by sound talent media and evergreen podcasts i hope you have a killer rest of the week i will be back on friday with another episode but until then remember to enjoy life metal and craft beer cheers vox and hops heads oh, no. Oh!